have a fascinating, as usual, program for today. Jerry is an avid railroad fan and Housatong historian whose lifelong interest prompted him to create the website Housatong Then and Now. His work has been showcased in Rail Fan and Railroad Magazine and National Public Radio's Engines of Our Ingenuity series. He also assisted the History Channel with Hoosick Lore for the popular Modern Marvel show, Drilling. He is currently authoring an article on the Hoosick Lining Towers for the Boston and Maine Railroad Historical Society's Bulletin Magazine. Jerry was the inspiration for the Rail Fan Conferences here in Grove, and he is widely recognized as an expert on the Hoosick Tunnel. I ask you to join me in welcoming our good friend and Hoosick Tunnel expert, Jared Kelly. Thank you very much. Uh, I usually, I'm loud enough, but they wanted me to use a microphone today. Uh, how many people here have been, is this the third one that you've been to, the second one? I just, I'm interested. Okay, the third. Everybody else, you're all newbies? Almost? Okay. Well, anyway, that's good. That's good. Um, we have a great show here today, and I would like to thank everybody for putting up with me for the third time. It's kind of neat. Um, I do promise that we have an interesting uh, slideshow, PowerPoint presentation. I have a pretty good collection of uh, tunnel, um, star reviews, etc., that I've collected over the years, and um, I'd like to bring a few to you. Uh, I was just wondering, did everybody get the joke? Welcome to Florida. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> In the beginning, when I first wanted to do this, I had promised everybody that I was going to uh, give as much information about the hotels in uh, Husi Tunnel Village as I could. And I, then I found out that there's like practically nothing <laughs> anywhere that I could find. And I, I, I called on all the experts, Stan Brown and Cliff Jacksonator, who we're going to hear from a little bit later. And there was very, very little uh, written about the actual operations of the hotel. Bob Hotel. Actually, there were three. Most people think there were just two. And I thought there were just two. So there were actually three because I actually I, I looked up an, uh, an ancient map, and the three hotels were Towers Hotel, which is closest to um, East Portal, and of course there's Rice's Jason Rice Hotel, which is right across from the Steel Bridge. Okay, w oh, would have been right across from the Steel Bridge, next to the Wicker Mill Road. And then uh, even less written, actually nothing written about the Hoosick House, which was right by uh, the train station. So you had your uh, you had your pick of three places. Most people, and I think probably uh, Towers Hotel, uh, might have gone out of business early, but we'll see. But I did find one interesting thing: an, an advertisement in an old, very old magazine on uh, Rice's Hotel. And I read through this this morning. I, I got a laugh. See if you think it's funny. Uh, here's the uh, the uh, Rice's Hotel. Jenks and Rice proprietors, one half mile from East Portal of the tunnel, at the junction of the Fitchburg and Hoosick Tunnel on Wilmington Railroads. Accommodation for for 60. Terms 10 to 15 dollars a week, and uh, two dollars and fifty cents a day. Okay, it gets it gets better. Two minutes walk from Fitchburg Railroad Station. Baggage transported free. <laughs> well, wait a minute. I know if I. If I was going to stay at the hotel, what about me? Can I get on the way? But that, it's funny the way they, that they put that. Okay, so I want today, I want everybody to go for a walk with me. Now the beauty of that is that you can stay seated. Okay, so we're going to go for a little bit of a walk. And we're going to start at Lucy Tunnel Station. Let's, let's imagine that maybe we came from Greenfield, maybe we came from North Adams, and we wanted to spend some time at Lucy Tunnel. These photos were taken in and around, and bear with me, these photos were taken in and around 1900, give or take five or ten years, okay? But I can guarantee you, it's what you would have seen uh, it, without a little walk, okay? So if the computer will, will work for us, let's see how it goes. Okay, now here is a map of the Hoosick Tunnel uh, Village, okay, which is in on the Florida side. Now, we've got, this Rice is in right there. This, what is now the steel bridge, which was the covered wooden bridge, okay? So we're going to start, and the Hoosick Tunnel House was right here, right up in there, and uh, the other hotel was down in here. So these are some of the early buildings and whatnot, and you know something, it pretty much looks like that today. Of course, the, 
Uh, Rice Inn is no longer there. It burnt down, unfortunately, as all great wooden buildings seem to. And uh, Bruce McDonald House is really nothing that I am aware of left of it. There's been an addition of uh, houses and whatnot in the area, but still is pretty much as, as it is. Whitcomb Summit Road, uh, the what was the wooden uh, covered bridge, which is now the old steel bridge, which was put in in around 1929-ish, okay? And the train station right here in the depot. Uh, we've got photos of most of this. All right, and I've, shown, I've had photos of the other stuff um, on, in prior shows. So that gives you a feel for what Hoosick Tunnel Village looked like. Now, people have asked me, where, where is Hoosick Tunnel? And I'll say, which one? And they say, well, what do you mean? I said, well, there's Hoosick Tunnel the town, there's Hoosick Tunnel the village, and there's Hoosick Tunnel Station. So, that we're all on the same page. I just want everybody to understand. But the Hoosick Tunnel, whoops, 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 whoops. The Hoosick Tunnel is B, up, on the, up in this corner, or actually over in here, a little bit, probably about a quarter of a mile up the road. Okay, we're all, we all know that. So we, Hoosick Tunnel Station is right there. And Hoosick Tunnel, the village, is right here. So the whole area is pretty much called Hoosick Tunnel, but I just wanted to get that uh, so that everybody was on the same page, because people do get a little bit confused. Okay, now, okay. We're getting off our train. The Hoosick Tunnel and the Wilmington Railroad has a track right there, that goes up the valley and into Vermont, okay, no longer exists, although it's a great walk, it's a great uh, rail trail. Um, who's the tunnel station, which would have been part of the Fishburg, you call it Union Station, although I don't think that ever was called Union Station, but it served two railroads. This picture I can tell you was after 1911, <coughs> thereabouts, because of the electric electrification, but it still would have looked the same in around 1900 or before, okay? So this is a not often seen picture of the, the steam locomotive right here and the uh, vintage car, pretty neat. Okay, so we just got off the train and we're going to go for a walk. <coughs> so we look behind us. Can everybody hear? Yeah. Okay, everybody hear me? Way back? Okay. All right, good. Uh, it Tunnel House? A uh, hotel, excuse me. And uh, this, I've got a couple of photos of it, and that's about it. Not much written about it. Um, I'm sure it was a comfortable place. It must have been a little on the noisy side with as many steam trains running by every day, uh, just outside, pretty much outside the door. And so the tunnel would have been, this is the road as it exi exists today, the dirt road that goes up and over the tracks. Okay? Where are the tracks in this picture? The, tra the tracks will be right in here. Okay. Right about in there. Okay? And the station would be over in right about in there. Uh, the map doesn't show where the Hoosick House was, I don't think, but I do know that it was a little bit. As you went up the road, it would be off to the left, and the station would be just a little bit to the right. Okay. Okay, we turn around, and we look across the Deerfield, and we see the Jenkson Rice Hotel. Now, Stan Brown had told me that when he was a little boy, he played, the hotel was gone, but it had a very interesting barn. It had a two-story barn. Now, I'm not sure if the buses were on the second story, but certainly carriages and hay and whatnot. So he used to play there as a kid. What was that, about 20 years ago, Stan? Uh, no, that's a little bit further back. <laughs> okay, all right. We right. in the 40s. Okay, and all right. My grandfather owned the flat at that time. Yeah. He planted the corn and so forth. Of course, I was a little shorter then. And I'd get out in the cornfield, and I wouldn't know which way was out. So I had to go to the end of the cornfield to see if I was on the roadside or on the mountainside. But that, that barn, if you want me to elaborate on that a little bit, well, okay. uh, it was a two-story barn, and a very large barn. 
Uh, the ramp uh, was actually constructed of uh, gravel and stone so that the horses could go to the second floor. And um, up in there, there was uh, stuff that was stored. It might have been removed from uh, uh, stores or from uh, uh, the hotel itself when it burned. But I remember the chairs and big old uh, display counters there with the glass front. And uh, there was other stuff that a, a kid like uh, I was at that time, would have a wonderful time. Oh, yes, you know. <laughs> but I would lose myself in there. And uh, it was a great memory. And I can remember uh, the, the, the trains that were going by during the war uh, with the troops leaning out and waving. And then the, the loads of tanks that were on the cars that were being shipped to the uh, or front of course, the state of the ocean as well. And also, uh, I, I can remember that the uh, bombers going overhead, whole fleets at a time. Of course, at that time, uh, uh, the, the Will Run plant in Michigan was putting out one B-24 an hour. Amazing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Stan. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we're looking across the river at the Deerfield, across the Deerfield at the Jenks and Rice Hotel, and probably the bond, I imagine. Okay, we're going to take a trip across the wooden bridge that, uh, don't hold me to this, it was built uh, in the late 1880-somethings. Okay, and uh, it later got replaced by the steel bridge, which was 1929, 28, 29, which is a little bit questionable now, but still used every day. You can drive your car across it. It's a little creaky, but still. Yeah, the railroad built that iron bridge. They probably built this one, too. I don't know. Boston, Maine. Yeah. And they built the iron bridge and still own it. So the town's kind of been in dilemma because railroad doesn't want to fix the bridge, right. and the town doesn't want to have a new bridge, so we have two, two homes that are on this side of the river, side of the, that are over there, so yeah. I don't know what's going to happen with that. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Okay, ever-evolving story with the railroad. <laughs> okay, there's, there's a look back at the Hoosick House to the left, and the uh, Covenant Bridge. And a, a nice horse. Of course, that horse was only in the carriage were only for baggage. Because <laughs> we covered it, you're going to have to hope it. Yeah. All right. Here's a picture of some uh, ladies on the front porch of the Jackson Rice Hotel. This is uh, one of the few pictures that I have in a little buggy there with uh, a pair of horses that uh, pulling up to the front. Looks pretty grand. Looks pretty nice. The, this, I would imagine that this is, would have been the stopping off point. You would have gotten on the train. And at that point, you would have to secure uh, a horse, horse and buggy, or uh, there was a stage uh, to get up uh, to whatever farm or whatever area you'd, you'd be wanting to go to. Uh, who knows, you know, so wherever. But uh, this was a, a, one of the drop-off points in a popular place, very popular. As we walk up the road towards Hoosick Tunnel, the tunnel, all right, we come upon the, um, the steel bridge. Uh, this is a really nice shot. This is before 1911 because there's no electric wires of a uh, locomotive, steam locomotive pulling down a bunch of 40-foot uh, boxcars across. And we notice that this is the second bridge on the site. There used to be a contractor's wooden bridge, and I see wood, uh, stone pilings that are not being used. And good chance that the, I would imagine that those are the original pilings of the, of the uh, wooden bridge that was there. That later. Uh, just, it just didn't hold up for uh, heavier trains, that's, that's for sure. So as we walk up the road, we're just about to uh, cross the tracks of the Music Tunnel. Yes? What's the building in the background? Okay, that's the compressor house. We're going to get to that because that is probably the next slide. Let's see. Yeah. This is right around 1900. Uh, the compressor house was used for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, it was uh, hy uh, hydropower to power uh, the, some of the original air compressors uh, used for the uh, burly drills in the uh, uh, blasting and drilling of the uh, east side. Um, there were a lot of firsts. It was the first uh, time that they actually used this. Where Ingersoll ran got it started. And it's where uh, the first use of air compressors, air tools, et cetera, the burly drill, the first reliable drill that made a, a big difference in the drilling of the Hoosick Tunnel. Before then, all the drilling was done by uh, a man with a, a steel star bit, huge star bit, and a guy with a 15 or 20 pound sledgehammer, and they'd turn the bit, and hit it, and turn the bit, and hit it, and they'd have to drill in holes that were almost just about three feet deep, then pack it with uh, black powder. So when they came up with the burly drill, 
is my model shows they had a, a carriage, a very heavy iron carriage with six burly drills on it, and it would have a compressor hose hooked to the uh, burly drills, and they'd pull the carriage up, secure the carriage, and then set the drills at the face, and then drill out. Another th another first that was done here is the drill hat. Now, what do you do? Just drill holes any way you want? No, you drill holes in kind of like a piece of cheese in it at an angle, and then the cutting holes, the shaping holes around, so that when you blast out with an electric fuse, because you could never do this by hand, obviously, when the, uh, the electric fuse was another first. But the electric fuse allowed the blasting of the new style patent to blow out the center chunks in a, in a wedge and allow the sides to come in in the void. Before then, they'd just blast, and it would just kind of stay, and some of it would come away, and some of it, but when you gave the, the rock a place to go, it allowed a much more to come out. So, and interestingly enough, if you were to talk to a miner today, they use the same pattern, the same design of going in at the, at the angles, and then going in with the shaping holes. That's exactly how it's done today. Another first from the Hussey Tunnel. Of course, they, they did it for 24 years, so you kind of like, that didn't work too good. <laughs> Let's try something else, you know. <laughs> okay, so here's the compressor house. This was also, I believe, uh, destroyed by fire. I think it was also used for uh, mixing uh, black powder later on. There was a, a Maxim, uh, I believe it was used by a Maxim company uh, to mix uh, black powder that was shipped out away like, later on. <coughs> and for a couple of other uh, things, but it was a three-story building. and. Uh, very interesting, and if you were to take a hike down there today, you can actually see the turbine pits, and if you get down into the turbine pits, well, they're about four feet deep, and take a camera and put it down below, you can actually see the barrel hoops of where the penstocks used to feed into the turbines. A lot, most of the wood is gone, it's rotted away, but the steel or the iron hoops is still there, and you can actually see a lot of that. And there's, a, there's still a lot to be seen in the building. Of course, the wall doesn't look quite like that anymore. But um, it's, it's dropped down to just about the bottom level of the first floor because it got a little, a little unstable. So we continue our walk up the Deerfield. Then we come to what they call the state dam. Okay, now when you deal with hydraulic power, hydropower, you're going to need a, a head of water. And this was about a half mile up. And it was a wooden crib dam filled with rock. And this is a pretty good shot. I really like this shot because it shows um, long after the Hoosier Tunnel was finished, you can see that the, it had been breached by Mother Nature. And this dam was something like 100 feet into the water. Because you know how dams have to be extremely heavy and extremely wide at the base to hold back the water. So we see here that uh, it's seen better days. And this is one of the control houses that was up above the sluice way. And the sluiceway travels down next to the Deerfield River and goes directly to the compressor house, where the, the water was channeled into the sluice of the uh, penstocks and turned the turbines to run the compressors. Okay, so that's kind of a neat picture. Uh, not very many pictures. This is an old postcard. Not very many pictures of the control house and the dam. And this is the last slide that I have, and it was entitled Happy Valley. <laughs> And what it is is the uh, a shot down from above the about uh, up above the east portal, back when there were no trees there, looking down into the valley, and here is the Hoosick Tunnel in Wilmington that went off to Vermont, up by the uh, up to follow the Deerfield up, and of course this is looking east towards Greenfield, and the tunnel portal would be down and through here someplace. As you can see, there's a lot, and we're. And uh, the Hoosier Tunnel Village is right about in there. And of course, the Deerfield, at the great bend of the Deerfield, right there. So that's a pretty interesting picture. Uh, another postcard that I have. So, are there any questions? Was there a water tower near the. Yes, there was. There was a water tower, as you can see, right here, for uh, watering the uh, steam locomotives. Um, we all know that the steam locomotives, uh, before 1911, before electrification, uh, the steam locomotives had to work extra hard because they actually had to power the train through the tunnel. And the tunnel rises 60 feet to its center. So they kind of call it a hill. So the, the train has to use all of its power to get up the hill, although it doesn't look like it's a 60 foot hill. That's why you can't see the other portal. 
because you're actually looking in and around 1,400 feet or so, you're looking at the, the, the roof would touch the floor if you drew a, a straight line. You can get an idea on the handout on the second page that shows us a diagram of how the tunnel was built. Up until 1911, until when the New, New Haven had taken over and they thought it was a great idea to electrify and take it easy on the poor steam engines, they would finally bank the fires of the steam engines to kind of get the fire down and the smoke down. That was the real issue. And pull them through with up to three electric locomotives. I have video. It's uh, I have uh, uh, video. It's interesting. Now that's the story. But the, the truth of the matter is, is that the electric engines weren't as powerful as they probably should have been in the first generation electrics. In fact, they were called experimental. Okay, they had huge motors that today would probably be about yay big, but their motors were huge. It would often take up to three locomotives to pull a steam train through. Now, the interesting thing that I find is that the, the story said they banked the fires and they didn't use their power. The steam engine didn't use their power and they were pulled through by the electrics. The truth of it is, is that it took the steam engine's power to get the train in motion. And the videos that I have show the steam engine working because you can tell when they're working, you see the black smoke come up, they'll stack. And uh, so you can tell then at that point, I would imagine, once they got the train moving, then the electrics would would have the momentum behind the vehicle, right? the train through. So anyways, that, yes? What, what is it that's up between Cascade? I can see a lot of construction up there. I'm sorry, what is it that's up between? What, did they, what was built up between Cascades? Right at the creek right from... You, are you talking about the, the rail, rail dam that kind of... Yeah, yeah, what was up there? Well, I can't speak now. It's been a few years since I've hiked up through there. I can tell you before Hurricane Irene, there was cast iron pipe that came down, that was still around, still in the creek, that came down from the railroad track dam. And I do believe, once again, there's not a lot written about the nuts and bolts of the construction of the tunnel, but I do believe that that was used as headwater for a uh, fresh water system that went down, not only to drill, not only for the drills, but for the Hoosie Tunnel Village. Because when you look at the east portal up on the hill, uh, and I think we've got a, uh, a picture of that someplace in here. Up on the hill, there are a bunch of houses and whatnot, and a small schoolhouse. It looks to be a schoolhouse. In Twin Cascades, right below there, Dome built a dam. Yeah. He piped the water down into the tunnel to clean out the boreholes. Yeah. And the pipe may still exist, but Hurricane Irene really did its soul. And uh, took a lot of stuff down from there, so I'm not sure if, it, if that pipe is still there. But there, are sec there was sections of uh, cast iron pipe that proved the point. Okay. Any other questions? Can you get to this place now? You could hike up to that point, but it's going to be all trees. You can't get to East Portal, but to get that view would be almost impossible. Maybe not that view, but you said that that was Music Village or whatever. Oh yeah, sure. Um, Music Village is just across. On, on, the, on the Florida side, which is now called Florida, uh, Florida side of the, of the river. And you know, there's lots of lots of houses, it's a, it's a small village. You still live. I don't know how difficult you Can you show on the map that you have where, is this where it is? Sure. Okay. Does anyone need a handout? <coughs> okay. So. Hoosick Tunnel Village is right in through here. Thank you. Okay. Question? Way over there. She's passing out. Oh, okay. Perfect. Are there any other questions? Uh, the bulk pipe, okay. The purpose of the elevation in the tunnel? The purpose of the elevation of the tunnel was for drainage. They knew they were going to, as all tunnels always, always uh, have uh, an issue with drainage. All right. And so the best way to deal with that is with uh, gravity. Not so much ventilation? No. Well, no. As a matter of fact, just the opposite. Uh, when they first talked about drilling the central shaft, there was a large argument because they didn't have an awful lot of money. They really didn't want to spend the money. And so the, the real argument, in fact, in the handout on the last page, has a, a wonderful article written by me. <laughs> All the ventilation in the tunnel. And what they, had to talk, what they talked about, and because they wanted what was called the attic, because you get in a couple thousand feet, and you're actually the floor is our, the ceiling at the portals. And then you get beyond that. So what you've got is an attic. So as a steam train goes up and over the hill, 60 foot hill, then you're going to have an area that's never ventilated. So they wanted to build a central shaft. Well, they took seven years to build the shaft. 
And yes, it worked great for ventilation, but then they had the big fight about what was the best way to ventilate it. And it's, it's obvious to us to put a fan house on the top. But they were talking about putting trap doors in, partly for the winter, and open them up for the summer. They were talking about running, uh, burning a fire to create a draft. They were talking about all kinds of crazy. It's all in the, it's all in the article. All right. So what they finally settled for was an open, just an open 1,028 foot shaft, which did a decent job of ventilation, but it really didn't do the trick. Mostly because you, when you get the cold air from the winter time, it wants to go down, and then you get the hot air from the summertime, it wants to go up. So it's like one of these mishmash things. And they still had a horrible time of ventilation until finally they put a powered fan in there. I think in the 1960-ish, I think somewhere in that vicinity. And in 1946, that's when they built the ventilation building that you see today. I like to call it the building with the jet engine sticking out of it. Because that's kind of what it looks like uh, on Central Shaft Road. Do you have any more of that handout? Yeah, yeah, sure. I got plenty more handouts, so no. Thank you. Just a good question about uh, when did they switch from two tracks to one, and why was that? 56? I believe it was 1956. Trains got wider, trains got taller. Yeah, and uh, but the track width is the same gauge. Yes, it's always been. Well, I won't say it's always been. Actually, they ran it. There was. I won't get into the narrative. That's in the article too. Okay. But, uh, it, they did have a narrow gauge railroad that ran in between the tracks when in 1927-ish, when they did one of the last major uh, clearance projects. That's why I call the the article uh, it was the title, uh, clearance project old and new news because when you read through. It's not the first time, it's not the, I hope this is going to be, well, they're planning on doing it again. And they had done it in 96. So 1996, I mean, come on, why, let's get this right. But anyway, that's another story. But anyway, so now that the state is, uh, in Norfolk Southern, has ponied up about $3 million to do the study. I believe the study's done in, as far as I know, I haven't heard of any news. So as far as if they're going to start, if they're going to do it, or whatever the case might be. I was uh, in touch with the engineering firm, or one of the engineering firms that would have been in on the job, and they know less than I do. <laughs> sure. What did they do? Did the train ever break down in the tunnel, or was so out of the tunnel? Yeah. Oh, yeah, they broke down. Uh, they'd stall uh, occasionally, they'd stall. Uh, if you have power that dies on you, and uh, yeah, I've heard some stories. I heard one story from an engineer that uh, he wasn't sure he was going to make. A center shaft, and he was all but ready to cut the to stop and just, you know, tie down the uh, the locomotive, the uh, freight consist, and take the locomotives out. And luckily, he made it through. But uh, usually, you know, it'd be, it would be it was more of, of a factor in the steam days that they weren't, weren't even sure if they were moving. That's how bad the ventilation and the smoke was in the tunnel. And it was common practice to take a broom and stick it out and hit the tunnel wall, because you were pretty close to the wall of the tunnel. You'd take a broom and stick it up and see if you felt some resistance. Because it is possible for a locomotive to actually stall and be spinning its, its wheels. It, it, it happens. So that was one of the things. And actually, oxygen was so poor in there that the fires would start to bank down. Now you're losing power. So, and you're going uphill. It's not a good combination. Not, not good at all. Any other questions? Sure. Well, two questions here. I'm making it as, as easy as possible. When did the foliage start growing in, in the uh, spot in that picture that you showed? And when did the uh, who toot and whistle cease to be a railroad? The who toot and whistle cease to be a railroad. I'm not going to guess it a day. Anybody out there that really? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> 62. Yeah, it would have been VS Swamp a nuclear plant. Was the final demise, and that that was their really last customer because they got to haul in a lot of stuff. But when they built a nuclear power plant, which would have been the 50s, 1960, um, that cut the line effectively in half. I don't know if they had an awful lot of customers, anyways. They weren't doing really great, but. When you cut a railroad line in half, that doesn't help them at all. So they got uh, to move in a lot of the construction stuff, and that was pretty much it from my understanding of it. Well, the uh, paper mill, the hidden boxcars, the yeah. company that I worked for, okay. recently in 1980. Oh. That's but that's on this side. Yeah. Okay, so, so we will put it the the road only to the paper mill, at least until 1980, maybe after that. I don't know if anyone here can work here and got a mill when it closed. Well, you see, it's a little bit more Well, that's this side of this one, so. 
the way I ask the customer, well, I believe uh, the, the part to Vermont stopped in the 20s during the building of the Howard Reservoir. So that would have been the 20s. Any other questions? Like, uh, that's not quite correct. <laughs> I think it was a little after that. But if you had a switchback that went up the dam, they, of course, had to abandon the track that was plugged by the reservoir. But they ran the track along the western side of the reservoir for quite a number of years after that. Is that the Catamount Trail? What they call uh, the Catamount Trail there? No, the Catamount Trail, let's see. Yeah, it does go through that. That's all right. right. Wait. Okay, the roads changed since I first saw the work. It's an interesting hike if anybody wants to make it. Uh, it's pretty level, and you get a nice view of the river. Not by the cow, too. What's that? Lake Carol, too. It's a, yeah, sure. <laughs> Uh, is that it, or do we have more questions? <laughs> oh, come on. Try to stop, Jerry. Try. I'll make something up. <laughs> sure. I heard on YouTube years ago, I was a video last year, and I said they're going to bring the track down lower to prepare freight. Right. Uh, as of a, a couple of years ago, they had proposed to do that. And like I said, uh, Norfolk Southern and uh, the government put up about $3 million. Not exactly sure exactly, but that's about what they did. Uh, to do the study of it, they had done a study. They ran a, a high rail vehicle through with a laser, special laser measurer type setup. Uh, the state has hundreds of thousands of measurements because the laser shoots out all these beams. And they wanted to make sure where all the clearance, the rocks, and what exactly the clearance was. So they have a very good idea. Um, where every nook and cranny of that tunnel is. The problem is, is that getting the price together, getting a contract to, to, together, and getting the money together to actually fund the project. How much that costs, I would only hazard a guess. They're spending three million just to look at it. I'm sure it's gonna be in the 20s and 30s, if not even more than that. But what I can tell you is that one interesting fact, I'll leave you with this, is uh, what I had heard is that back in 96, they had, had hired a company from British Columbia uh, to raise the height and drop, or drop the track, whatever the case might be. And they came in and they had this big huge pine cone type thing that would eat away at the roof of the tunnel with a special truck that would catch the dust and they worked their way through the tunnel. And you can see, if you look at these portal, you can see the big, they made a notch. Just wide enough. Not probably, it should have been wider, but just wide enough. And, uh, the company went bankrupt about halfway through the project. So what do you do? Now the whole idea is, is to let's let's get this project finished. So Guilford at the time said, whatever it's going to cost, we'll finance the project. So they actually, even though the company just you know kind of said that's it, we don't have any more money. Our price was because it's a lot harder. That rock is extremely difficult to, to get through, and they hadn't planned on it. And I think if they had written, uh, read the Pinprick of Light and a few other uh, <laughs> books, they would have gotten the, the gist of the fact that blasting on the east side was really, really tough. Uh, Cliff, I'm sure, is going to get into that. And um, it just, uh, it was a real nightmare because it's quad, quads nice, granite, nasty, hot, hot, hot rock. And for the blasting agents at the time, until they finally got into nitro, tri-nitroglycerin, um, it was a real match for the uh, goose quill fuses uh, with black powder. That's for sure. And uh, once again, we see it back in 96 where the, uh, the contractor was bankrupt. But they did finish the project, but once again, if you read the article, it wasn't enough. So here we go again. <laughs> yeah. You ever heard a story about cars getting stuck in there? Oh, cars getting stuck in there? Yeah. We did have a derailment in there at one time with propane tanks. Vehicle. Uh, there was, in the Pinprick of Light, there's a story of. Um, of uh, uh, two college students that drove the, tried to drive the car through, almost made it, made it within, from what I understand, within sight of the East Portal. Uh, something happened, probably blew all the tires out of the car, and whatever it was, they got stuck. They had to stop the, the approaching train. Alden Dreyer, who was, uh, who uh, runs the trolley down at uh, uh, Shelton Falls, uh, I believe was the dispatcher on that night. 
But uh, the story is more or less covered in a pinprick of light, which is for sale in the, which is a great book, by the way. And, and not to say cliffs to the cliffs is the ultimate research. <laughs> the ultimate research. But anyways, I'm, I'm very glad that I could have helped him out with it. And I'm glad, very proud that this high school kid could correct it. PhD's homework. <laughs> but anyway, so if, that, if there are no other questions, yes, sir. Were there, <clears throat> were there actually two operating lines through? I know you said there's one that went for construction between the rail. At one time, were there two? Yes. Two yes, tracks? Yes, there was a double track up until about 1956, I think was the date, that they finally ripped up and went to single track, to the center of the town. Believe it or not, I went through that on a, I went through there on a troop train in 1957. Really? Because <laughs> okay. I was a kid, I didn't know any different to look out the windows because you couldn't see anybody. <laughs> well, people, people ask me, have you ever been through the Hoosie Tunnel? And I said, well, yeah, I yeah. have. Back in the old days when they ran uh, passenger specials through and stuff like that, I said, but you can get much the same uh, effect by walking into your closet, closing the door, and shutting it <laughs> You know, it's a great place to be, but it's kind of like, it's not like you're going to see it off a lot unless you're in the uh, car or something with the big headlights in the back of the car. But yeah, you really can't see much of anything. If that's it. I read something on a uh, Usyk Express that was dated 2013. Right, yeah, we, they ran a train through, yeah. You can take a train through every once in a while, they do that every once in a while? I wouldn't say every once in a while. I would say that that was a kind of a, a fluke, and uh, they, they brought a passenger train through, and uh, went over to New York. Come out all Saturday and Sunday. Okay, we're going to talk. <laughs> yeah, we're going to talk. I thought so. The first time, okay, I didn't want to go around for a That's all. Such a deal. That's a good deal. <laughs> You gotta remember. Uh, you gotta remember that excursion in 2013. They did one piece of history that was uh, seen by myself and a few dozen other rail fans. They ran full-length dome cars through Hoosick Tunnel, which yeah. was a first. Yeah. And the, and the, uh, and the Pan Am F units brought the, the train through. Was, was very very classy. And I do remember that the engineer had a tie. <laughs> they pretty cool. <laughs> That's it. I really want to give the show off to keep the picture up and end up. I'm going to talk about the people. Uh, anybody know who Moses Rice is? Show him out, folks. Yep. I mean, he's the founder. He's the first guy that came to the valley here at the first plantation. Uh, his son built the first road over the mountain. Then they had the hotel. And actually, one of the Rices was on the first board of directors at Greenfield. The, put, your, put your map back. Here. Put your map back. Put your mask. Granger was one of the engineers on this side through the, the uh, Crocker days and then to the, towards the end of the, and the completion of the railroad. And so he must have stayed here and, and lived here afterwards. Okay. Um, if that's it, then uh, I'd like to give the show back to uh, Kathy and uh, she's going to do her introductions. Thanks, Jerry.